before we get into the material, I want to give a brief disclaimer that this material is mostly for college engineering students or people who are just generally interested about 3D classical dynamics. However, I do not think it's relevant to high school AP tests, since when I took high school AP physics mechanics, I didn't need to know any of this at all. Also, I want to say that I'm teaching this in a way that I learned from Professor Paul Mitagi at Stanford, uh, who knows a lot more than I, and so if you want to learn more about classical mechanics, please check out his books about advanced dynamics and computation. To get started, I want to show three examples that may seem similar at first, but are actually drastically different. So first, here we have a book that's, you know, we have a rope tied to it, and you're grabbing onto that rope. And then you spin this book on a rope around you in a circle. So let's say we start here and then we spin it in a circle. Let's say it's moving at constant speed the whole time. And so you go around the circle and it gets back to its starting points. And say it's moving constantly and you take two seconds to get it back to its original starting position. If an approach that may seem familiar would be angular velocity is equal to change in angle over change in time. In this case, it would be two pi because it's going a full rotation divided by two seconds, which gives you pi radians per second. This is angular velocity, right? Let's see a different example. So here's an example that may at first seem like the previous example. We have a book starting at some position here, and we spin it around at constant speed. It goes around in a circle. And it takes two seconds to get back to its initial position. The only difference is that the book now, instead of being attached to a rope in your hand, is just oriented in the same direction throughout the entirety of its uh, motion around the circle. Can't we just still use the same idea of angular velocity equals change in angle over change in time? Turns out this does not work. The angular velocity in this case is actually zero. Now, what does this even mean? And what is this funky notation I'm using? We'll come back to this later. Now, I personally think this last example is even funkier. Let's say our book has been condensed to an infinitesimally small point in space. So it's just like a geometric point now. And same idea, it starts at some position, then we go, we move around in a circle at constant speed, you know, and get back to this initial position, right? Instead of a book, we just have a geometric point now. Same period, takes two seconds to get back, moving at constant speed. So can we use the same idea of angular velocity equals change in angle over change in time? And of course, again, we cannot do this. In this case, the angular velocity is actually undefined. Now, what does that mean here? Why is it undefined for this? Um, how does it differ from any of the previous examples at all? Let's get into it. So what's even going on here? Before we get started, feel free to toss out any preconceptions you have about angular velocity, and let's build our understanding from scratch. Hopefully that makes things a little easier. Let's take a look at the expression that I wrote for example two. We see that angular velocity is a vector relating b and n. Now what are b and n? b and n are both reference frames. I use b to denote the reference frame for the book, and n to refer to the reference frame for Earth. I'll describe more about what a reference frame is in a bit. Now that we understand that angular velocity is a vector relating to reference frames, we can sort of begin to understand the definition of angular velocity. The definition of angular velocity kind of blew my mind when I first saw it, and it didn't make any sense initially, so bear with me for a bit. This is its definition. The angular velocity is embedded as a cross product within an equation. So this cross product is the time derivative in reference frame n of any vector is equal to the time derivative of the same vector in another reference frame, in this case b, sums with the angular velocity vector of the two reference frames cross products with that same vector. And this can relate any vector to two reference frames, any, any two arbitrary reference frames. And this angular velocity here is the angular velocity vector that we're talking about. Now this equation is called the golden rule of vector differential or differentiation. 
also known as the transport theorem of vector differentiation. And it is perhaps the most important or one of the most important equations in 3D kinematics. It's probably pretty confusing right now. So let's dive a bit deeper into each of its components and begin to unpack what this all means. So what is a reference frame? I will give a very simplified explanation in this video, but if you want a much more technically rigorous one, I highly recommend checking out Paul Medighi's book that I mentioned earlier. So this simplified explanation I'll give to help us get the ball rolling on the concept, but it's not all there is to a reference frame. So first, a reference frame is a 3D object that can be constructed from at least three non-collinear points whose distances from each other remain constant over time. So it's fixed in uh, time in terms of the dimensions not changing. Now, this is a bit abstract. So what does this mean in practice? Um, I will introduce two types of reference frames that I think are most commonly found in engineering practice. And so we have just solid rigid objects, let's say like a baseball. We're gonna assume the baseball is not squishy and flexible. Let's say it's completely rigid. It's a rigid baseball. Or like the book earlier, let's pretend the book doesn't really open and close. It's just a solid book that um, all the dimensions remain constant over time. It's completely a brick, it's solid. And so uh, rigid objects, rigid bodies, are a reference frame. And then we can also define Earth as a reference frame. So let's draw. All right, that is good enough, North America. Yeah, so Earth is another reference frame. These are the main ones we'll be using as engineers. Um, so if you don't fully understand all the technical details behind what a reference frame is and how it's defined, that's okay for now. Uh, please read up on it later if you want to learn more. Now, something else that is important in order for us to use a reference frame is to understand the concept of a rigid frame. So I'll write it out here, rigid frame. And a rigid frame is an orthogonal unit vector basis that is fixed to a reference frame. Um, so orthogonal meaning right angles and unit meaning the magnitude of each vector here is one. Now you may are you may be familiar with the notation i j k. It's the same thing, um, just three orthogonal vectors, unit vectors, that we place onto some rigid body or earth, and it moves around um, relative to that rigid body. I'm going to change the notation here a bit from i j k to something that is more specific to the reference frame. So this is reference frame B, and I'll call this uh, BX, BY, and BZ. And then Earth here will have, um, I like to call it NX. I call Earth uh, reference frame N usually. And then NX and Y and NZ would be the uh, rigid frame on Earth. This rigid frame is important to define in order for us to write vectors that are related to the reference frame of any given rigid body. Another important concept to understand is what does it mean to take a time derivative of a vector relative to a reference frame? So here's an example. We have vector v here written in terms of reference frame n. So xn, x plus y, n, y. To take the time derivative relative to reference frame n, since v is already written in terms of reference frame n, we can just take the time derivative of the x component and the time derivative of the y component, like so. This is pretty straightforward. But this only works if vector v is already defined in terms of reference frame n. Let's take another example. What if we have another reference frame here about ax, ay, az? That's different from reference frame n. So in this case, we have v is equal to, let's call it like mAx plus nAy plus, what's another letter, q, az. The derivative relative to reference frame n is not equal to m dot ax plus 
n.ay plus q.az. This does not work. Um, in order to solve for the derivative relative to the reference frame n, if you're only given a uh, reference frame a, the only way to solve for this is to use the golden rule of vector differentiation. Now we have everything to understand the golden rule of vector differentiation. We know what a reference frame is, and we know what it means to take a time derivative relative to a reference frame. But at this stage, you may want to ask a philosophical question. Then what does it mean to have an angular velocity? We don't see any change in angle over change in time or anything like that. Like, what's the physical meaning behind angular velocity? Actually, this is all there is to it. It's just a vector defined by this math. It's a vector embedded within this cross product within this equation. That's all it is. Now, when we have a simplified 2D version, in some cases we can simplify to just change an angle over change in time. But at the end of the day, angular velocity is just this vector defined in this expression. Let's go back to the spinning book example to motivate what this all means in the big physical picture. So here we're back at the spinning book on a rope. One thing you may actually notice about the golden rule of vector differentiation is that you can't explicitly solve for the angular velocity since you can't really divide out this cross product. And that's okay. Let's still talk through the direction of vectors and see what this golden rule means in the big picture in 3D. So first I drew out the uh, reference frames for Earth and the book. And I also drew out the book reference frame as the book rotates throughout since the reference frame has to be fixed to the orientation of the book. I define the vector that we care about as this position vector r from the center of the circle to the center of mass of the book. One thing we can see pretty easily is that this value here is a zero vector because no matter where the book is on the circle, this vector r does not change in orientation relative to the book. So it's always going to be collinear with this by unit vector here. It's always going to be the same. So as far as the book is concerned, in the book's point of view, vector r never changes at all. It looks the same. It's always going to be um, some constant times by hat. So that's the book's reference frame. But what about the earth reference frame? What does it look like to the earth as r moves throughout this circle? You see that the r, this r position vector tracks the center of mass of the book. And this center of mass moves tangential to the circle. So this is the change in the uh, r vector as far as Earth is concerned. So this is this vector, and that's the direction it points. So this is some non-zero vector pointing in some direction tangent to the circle. And so we have angular velocity vector cross product with the position vector gives us this uh, derivative vector. Does this make sense from the right-hand rule? And so what vector crossed with this vector gives us this vector direction? And you can see that the angular velocity vector will point in the nz or bz direction. It's the same direction. So it points up, right? And so this up crossed with this r gives us this derivative vector, which makes sense from our golden rule. Something that you may also remember from the right-hand rule is you can point your thumb in the direction of angular velocity and curl your fingers, and that should be the motion of whatever object is rotating. That actually, that intuition actually still applies here. So if we look at this, uh, this angular velocity vector that we deduced, it's pointing up, up according to the book, so in bz or nz directions. If you point your thumb up and you curl your fingers on your right hand, then you get this motion of the book rotating uh, counterclockwise, which is what we expect. Okay, now let's start looking at the weird ones. Here's the book that spins in a circle, but the book stays the same orientation as it goes around the circle, relative to Earth, right? So the book faces in a way that we can read the word book here. Remember, we can choose this vector r as any vector we want. So let's let's say I'll choose it as this vector, some vector along the spine of the book for some reason. And we can draw that vector on the book as it moves throughout the circle as well. And we can also draw this vector um, 
at intermediate stages as a book moves around, like so. As the book moves around the circle, this is what the vector looks like, because it's just this point on the spine of the book, and the book doesn't uh, rotate relative to Earth, right? And so using this golden rule of vector differentiation, we can see that this uh, derivative here is still the zero vector, because according to reference frame of the book, this vector is not moving anywhere. It's not doing anything. It's, it looks the same as far as it's concerned. But as far as Earth is concerned, it is still the same vector. So this change is also zero. Why is it the same vector? So a vector is a magnitude and a direction, right? So it points in the same direction as it goes around the circle. And the magnitude is the same too. It's just uh, two points on the book from this corner here to some point along the spine of the book. And so the magnitude is the same, the direction is the same. As far as Earth is concerned, it's the same vector. So it doesn't change over the course of the book. And so we have a zero vector here. And so um, this R is su it's some non-zero vector. But in order to get zero as a result from crossing with R, then the angular velocity vector also has to be zero. So this, this is why the angular velocity in this case is a zero vector. Now here's a trippy one. Remember that I said this angular velocity was undefined? Here's why. It has to do with the reference frames B and N. So N is the reference frame of Earth, which we can basically always define as defined in the other examples. But what is B, the reference frame of the book? In this case, we're assuming the book is a geometric point, so it doesn't take up any space, right? But remember that a reference frame is a rigid 3D object. It needs some kind of rigid body to associate with, right? It's, it's a 3D object, but a geometric point is not a 3D object. Therefore, we cannot define a reference frame. And it doesn't make sense to define three orthogonal unit vectors for a geometric point. And so in this case, angular velocity is undefined because we, we can't define reference frame B and therefore what is the angular velocity relating B to N? It doesn't exist. Now before we wrap up, I want to show a simplification in 2D that is very useful in many engineering applications since a lot of times we want to assume 2D rotation to help solve our problems. Previously, we discussed how we cannot algebraically solve for this angular velocity vector because you cannot divide out this cross product. But there is a shortcut in 2D. 2D meaning that there is a shared vector, um, shared unit vector between the two reference frames during motion. So in this case, NZ and BZ will always point in the same direction when the book is revolving around the center points. They're basically fixed vectors, um, NZ and BZ. They don't change. And so if uh, 2D and we have a, let's see, a fixed vector between the two reference frames. We can define an angle between the reference frames. In this case, let's say an angle between nx and bx. We'll call that theta. And theta is this angle with a positive nz sense, meaning that if you curl your thumb in the motion of theta, uh, curl your right hand in the motion of theta, your thumb will point in the positive nz direction. If this is the case, if it satisfies these conditions, then the angular velocity of reference frame B and N is equal to theta dot uh, NZ, which is also the same thing as theta dot BZ since those are the same unit vector. This may look familiar now. This theta dot, right, this um, change in theta over time is what uh, a lot of us are familiar with from like high school mechanics classes. And this is where it comes in. It's a simplification in 2D if there is a fixed unit vector between two reference frames. And this is, of course, really handy in many engineering applications, such as robotic arms and so forth. So that concludes this brief introduction to angular velocity and the golden rule of vector differentiation. We've barely scratched the surface of classical mechanics. So if you want to learn more, I recommend reading Paul Mitigy's books, which I've linked in the description. And otherwise, I hope this is useful and good luck on your studies.